Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church in Lansdowne this morning. It's good to see you all here. Thank you for coming out on this uh, warm morning. Uh, we've got a few announcements this morning, uh, not just from me, but from some other members of the congregation. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go through that. If you are joining with us on Zoom this morning, we uh, invite you to put your prayer requests into the group chat now so that we can recognize those when we get to that point in the service. Uh, Mary, our administrator, is still on vacation. She'll be back Thursday this week, so the office is closed through Wednesday. If you need to get into the office before that, um, I will be here. I'll be around. Just call or email or text me to make sure that I'm in the office before you show up and nobody's there. Um, and I think those are the two that I have. Penny, is Penny still outside helping? Okay, well, I will give Penny's announcement then. Uh, so Penny Klingler uh, is president of the Interfaith Food Cupboard. The Food Cupboard uh, is looking for some more volunteers uh, to help on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, which is when they uh, distribute food uh, from four to six in the afternoon. And uh, it's a great time, it's a great way to uh, get to know some members of the community and uh, they're always in need of more help. Specifically, uh, they just got a donation of food this morning um, and are gonna probably need some help after worship, uh, putting some of that stuff away. So if you've got a few minutes after worship, uh, I'm sure that they could use your help down in the food cupboard. I think that was the gist of the announcement. Is that right? Okay. All right, so we've got two more. Uh, Lusana is gonna come up and talk a little bit about lemonade on the lawn, and then Margaret will give our visitor welcome, and then we will get started with worship. Good morning, family. So, lemonade on the lawn. Oh, the mask. I tell you, it's becoming part of my face. <laughs> uh, good morning, family. So, lemonade on the lawn will come to a close once the heat really changes. I decided to try to, well, we decided to try to extend to some given the climate situation we're living under. So, normally, coffee hour would start and We'd have the nice hot coffee for you guys, which we don't want to think about right now, but um, we're going to extend the lemonade on the lawn for a bit. We're going to continue outside also once we do start up the coffee hour, um, again, given the heat and our COVID situation. So the other thing is Franks and Families coming up um, September 11th. With all those in mind, we're looking for donations, volunteers or monetary donations especially volunteers. Um, there's going to be a donation uh, bowl or a cup or some little basket or something out on the tables during lemonade on the lawn and coffee hour to help with that. Or if you have donations you want to give to me personally, you can do that as well. But please look to volunteer. I'm going to put together a sign-up sheet um, in the very near future. Um, uh, you can always talk to me about it, or Margaret, and, and let us know if you want to volunteer. That would be grateful, but there will be a sign-up sheet that you guys can maybe look over and select a date you maybe want to host, or if you want to maybe aid in the hosting. I, I, that would be good, too. It is a bit much for maybe a one- or two-person team um, week to week, so it would be nice if we can get some participation. Uh, Franks and family, we're looking for donations with that, if you guys remember or don't know about it. Um, September 11th, we have Frank's available after service with drinks and hopefully maybe some fruit for dessert. Of, and again, announcements will be further with that. But bear in mind, maybe some donations for dessert um, to go along with that would be nice. And help for that will definitely be needed as well. Um, any further information, you can talk with me or Margaret. And thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't see anyone new for, or here for the first time. At least El, um, Eleanor didn't mention anyone. Um, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, as you know, we are having our um, community day on um, October 16th, um, immediately after church. We've gotten really a good number of um, vendors or um, organizations that would like to participate. Um, so we always want to have as many people from the community, not just church members, attend um, the event so it makes it worthwhile for 
um, the organizations that are coming. So I have, oh, uh, I have, I didn't bring any flyers today, but I have it in email, and I know we had the little cutouts um, out in, um, in the front, um, but if you want to share the flyer on Facebook or just, you know, old time flyer, put in people's mailboxes, um, let me know. I can either email it to you or I can um, bring, you know, make copies and bring it to church. Um, the other thing that we've always done for community day, I know October 16 sounds like really far away, but um, we always do the flu vaccines and we are going to do that again this year. Um, I'm going to have a sign, it, sign up sheet. I know Harry actually volunteered to do one because um, we may also do um, COVID vaccines, not us for either Pepper Pharmacy or um, the health department will do it, but we have to have at least 25 people signed up. So again, um, Harry has volunteered to do a sheet for that, but we, in order for them to do the COVID vaccine, we definitely have to have um, the number, otherwise they can't come out. So we are going to um, start a sign-up sheet for anyone that is interested in the vaccines. It's first come, first serve. Generally, we get 75. And um, um, in past years, most of it was the congregation, but we've actually done a lot um, um, for people from the community. So again, we have a, a committee. Um, there's quite a few people from the congregation that are on the committee. Um, our next meeting, I believe, is maybe next week can't remember, but if you're interested in being a committee or volunteering, um, please um, let me know. So again, welcome. Oh, yes. Sure. Is that vaccine, that vaccine, or is that oh, um, it's, I believe it's boosters, but if, again, if we have enough people, they'll do first vaccine and all of that. The health department will do it, and also um, Pepper Pharmacy would do it. The flu vaccines, in the past, we've done the over 65, I believe it is, the high dose, and um, the regular dose. We generally don't do um, kids, like, you know, young, young kids. We generally don't do those just for, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, the nurses are generally from our congregation is, um, if you're a nurse and you've never volunteered before and would love to volunteer, because they give us a vaccine. I'm talking about the flu vaccine now, yeah, but we have to provide the nurses. So. Anyway, I think I talk, I talk longer than my normal welcome, but um, <laughs> it was in my head, so I figured I'd do the reminders. Again, welcome, welcome. Um, it's a warm Sunday, but it's a nice day out, and football season's coming. So as you guys know, when football season starts, when I'm up here, what do I always say? Go Eagles? So go Eagles. Good morning, church invite you to join us as we begin our worship with the call to worship. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come! Let everyone who hears say, Come! Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift Come to the tree of life, the Alpha and the Omega. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Please join me in our gathering prayer. It is done in unison. O oh God, who opens our prison doors and releases us from our faults, keep us near to you in the hours of each day that by the power of the prayer, Jesus prays for us, and the light of your word, we might drink of your living water, know true joy, and serve you to the end of time. Amen. Our hymn of praise is When Morning Gilds the Skies, number 487.
Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and beg God's mercy for the renewal and the amendment of our lives. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. Gracious power, you call us to your everlasting springs to be drenched and reformed, but we fail to heed you. We do not turn with love to our neighbors, to ourselves, or to you. Forgive us for our failings, shield us from our due, and guide us into unity with all for the sake of the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the compassion of the God who prays for us, with us, and in us, you are forgiven. For the sake of the one who was sent to show us the face of love, and who died and rose, one with the Father and with us. Join me in our prayer of illumination. Holy God, whose voice is heard in the thunder and in the silence, speak to us now by the power of your spirit that we may hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our first scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 14, verse 1, and then jumping down to verse 7 through 14. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 77 in the New Testament section. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, They were watching him closely. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place. So that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they also may invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. 
But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of the Lord. to and say thank you so much your gifts are beautiful can we give them another round of applause I want to invite all of our uh, children up for our children's sermon now everybody doing today? Good, good. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, our scripture passage for this morning. It's a story about the Apostle Paul and his friend Silas. They've been traveling around um, all over Asia Minor and then now they're on their way to Greece and something happened and there's a bit of a misunderstanding and they get thrown into prison. Not a great thing that happens, right? They get thrown in prison. Can you imagine how they might feel? 
at that point? How might they feel? They might feel guilty. Guilty, maybe? Okay. Sad. Sad. Yeah. They may be worried if they ever get out. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happens, though, is really something quite interesting while they're in there. So they get thrown into, like, the, the innermost cell. And it's real dark, and I think you're all probably right. They're probably feeling sad, maybe worried, maybe afraid that they might not ever come out. And what happens is they start singing. They start, the text tells us they start singing, they start uh, praying, and then all the other people in the prison with them start to listen to them. Did you know that singing can actually help you get through hard times? So I want to tell you a funny story. One time, Alice and I were on a flight. We were going from Houston, where we used to live, to Detroit. We were going up for a family gathering. And there was a real bad storm the entire flight. It was like a three-hour flight, and it was just like riding a roller coaster the whole time. Just up and down, bad turbulence. And I get really bad motion sickness. So you can imagine how I might have been feeling this whole time. It was so bad that like, I just put my head down like this and just did not look up the whole trip. I was just praying, God, please let this flight be over as quickly as possible. The only thing, the only thing that was able to keep my mind off of how bad I felt that whole time is, I'm not, I'm not kidding, I literally sat there like this, and I sang Amazing Grace to myself the whole time for three hours. You know, <laughs> yeah. With no sleep. Yeah, there was definitely no sleeping, but, I made, but it helped me get through the flight. I didn't throw up, which was great, because I thought I was going to several times. Well, I wish I could have, but that was, not a, that was not an option for me at that point. But I want you to think, sometimes there's going to be something that happens in your life, I'm sure, where it's going to be a real scary situation, it can be hard, it can be tough, you can be very worried. I want you to remember that sometimes when that happens, you can sing to yourself. You can make sure that your, your mind is focused on not necessarily what's going on right then, but there's a, there are ways to help you get through that. Okay? Will you guys say a prayer with me? Yes. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for giving us voices, giving us voices to, sing to sing and to pray and to, pray and to, help, others. And to help others. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, y'all. Unfortunately, that is a very true story. <laughs> One that I hope to never have to repeat. So our text this day, uh, if you're paying attention at home, is uh, out of the typical lectionary cycle. We're moving away from that just for one week. One of the um, preaching groups that I'm in is, we decided that it would be a good idea for us all to preach on the same text in one Sunday, um, which is nor not normally the case, uh, but here we are. So if you're if you're worried about moving off the lectionary, as I know many people are, know that, there are, know that there are at least three other Presbyterian churches around the country that are looking at this text today. So let's get a little bit of an orientation about where we are. We're in the second half of the book of Acts, uh, which has been following sort of the movement of the Spirit through the disciples, sort of going farther and farther away from Jerusalem. Um, and now we've, focused, we've shifted our focus away from sort of the, the 12 disciples and move specifically to the travels and the works of the Apostle Paul. Paul's just returned from a recent trip to Jerusalem, uh, where he now begins focusing even more on this mission to the Gentiles. And after a quick little trip through Asia Minor, where he had been before that, he's now gone into Greece and specifically to Macedonia. And uh, we first catch him uh, in the Roman colony city of Philippi, um, made famous for where the, Paul's later letter to the Philippians comes from. Uh, this is a city made up mostly of retired Roman legions. Uh, Julius Caesar had famously restored this city um, after, after uh, his wars, mainly mostly 
of, of Roman uh, legions and Roman soldiers. And so that has a lot to do with the identity and the reputation of the city. And so for, upon first arriving here, uh, he's been told about a place of prayer outside of the city, and this is where he meets uh, the, the famous single businesswoman, uh, Lydia, who is the seller of fine purple cloth. She becomes baptized with those around her, and that's where the story picks up. We're sort of in that same place of prayer outside of the city of Philippi. So listen now to the word of the Lord. This is Acts 16, 16 through 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, proclaiming to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up, and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, and he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he, is an then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who gets to define who you are? How do you define yourself? And what does that have to do with how you interact with the world? Today's story, I think, is a case of people's identity being formed not by their own choosing. At least I think that's one way to look at this text. The first person we meet is a woman who is filled with a spirit of divination, we're told. In the original Greek, we're told that she has what they call a python spirit. It's an identity and a term that derives from the mythology around the ancient Greek city of Delphi, the place where the famous oracle of Delphi resided. The mythology goes that a great serpent, a python, lived below ground under Delphi and would whisper prophecies to the oracle there, hence the python spirit. She's described by this, and we're also told that she is owned by other men in the town who are using her gifts for their own profit. So in this way, she was not able to make her own decisions or have control of her own body. And so she is presented as 
who other people say that she is. The second person in the story whose identity has been formed for them is the jailer. The jail cells burst open and the chains are broken through no fault of his own. When he had fallen asleep, things were normal, and when he woke up, he thought that the only job option for him was to end his own life. He was so identified by his job that he thought his entire life was based on it. And in these two people, we see two ways that the world has defined who we are by what we do. The slave girl is only useful, only has worth and value because she has a gift that is profitable for other people. Her economic value is her value to those around her. Notice that once an annoyed Paul takes away that gift, that ability, her slavers get angry. Paul has taken away part of her social identity. And in a similar way, the jailer faces struggles similarly. One scholar, Eric Bredo, puts it this way. He says, empire has so shaped his identity that his very being is tied into the completion of his duties. Empire has taught him that his very worth depends on his function in the machinery of Rome. And then he continues with what I think is a great line. He says, we no longer live under an empire akin to Rome, yet we have not escaped the clutches of imperial forces. How do we think of ourselves? How do we define who we are? Do we often find our identity, like the jailer, first and foremost by what we do? That is a reflection, then, of how the forces of empire are still with us. And they still shape us. How far do you have to get into a conversation with someone that you've just met before you get to that question? You know the question. What do you do for a living? <laughs> At best, the answer to that question tells us something about that person's passions and interests. But at worst, it allows us to quickly and to easily make value judgments about the worth of that person. I'm willing to bet that each of us, me included, has an unconscious value system in place that puts more weight on certain types of jobs than others may not necessarily be the same value system for all of us, but I bet we all have that system. Where do you think that system came from? It came from a system that values certain types of work more than others. We talked about this last fall in our book study on the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. She talks in that book about how a caste system in that system, certain occupations are assumed for certain castes of people. We assume that certain types of people are predetermined to fulfill some job roles. What happens then is that that gets ingrained into our subconscious, into our psyche. So much so that people at all levels of the system then tend to fulfill those roles because they know of no, of, of no other way to be. Or, even if they see it, they have a hard time breaking out of that system. In our society, that mindset, that system, is exacerbated and sustained by white supremacy, where we put value judgments and assumptions on people based on what they look like, based on the color of their skin. Friends, that is not a system of living or finding identity based on the gospel. The gospel in and of itself is a radical, anti-imperial, and counter-cultural mindset where the least become first, where the rich are sent away hungry, where there's good news for the poor and the oppressed, where the debts are forgiven and captives are set free. So just as an experiment, what would happen if we stopped asking that question? What do you do for a living? Or what do you want to do for a living? 
and instead based our judgments and our relationships first and foremost on the fact that each person that we meet is made and reflects the image of God. And as a reminder that that goes for the people that we love and the people that we cannot stand. I'll tell you, for me, just the simple act of, since when that was brought up to me, when that was pointed out to me, trying to go through conversations, meeting new people, and not asking that question, what do you do for a living, has been difficult. I've been trying this for like at least a few years now. It is more difficult than it might seem. But if we can move away from valuing people only for how, how they do or don't contribute to the economy, we can live into that gospel-centered reality that sees us all as fully and equally valuable and equally worthy of life and of love. That type of mindset change can change communities. It can bring people together. I know because I've seen that happen. Five years ago this week, uh, Hurricane Harvey hit the city of Houston, which was where we were living at the time, brought the entire Gulf Coast to its knees. Texans, as we would learn, were pretty used to hurricanes at this point. As the saying goes, this was not their first rodeo. Even when forecasters kept telling everyone that this was going to be different, this was going to be a different storm that we all needed to be prepared, you didn't really see too much panic from people in the city. Grocery stores typically ran low on the type of food that you normally run low on during a hurricane. People were told to hunker down in their houses, and for the most part, everybody did just that. But then over the course of four days, the city received something like 53 inches of rain. There was so much rain coming out of the sky that scientists had to go back and redo their models for how much water could physically fall out of the sky in a given amount of time. So there were homes that were flooded and destroyed. Some parts of the town were obviously hit worse than others. But near the church that I was an associate pastor at, people who thought that they had weathered the storms, that their homes had, be, had been spared through this whole thing, woke up in the middle of the night to find feet of water in their house that had not been there when they had gone to bed just a few hours before. What happened was that the reservoirs that protected the city had to be opened because there was fear of a breach coming around from the outside of the levee. And there wasn't enough time to inform everyone and let alone evacuate anybody out of the town. So for the five days after that happened, uh, the church sort of inadvertently uh, opened its doors and sort of functioned as a makeshift shelter. It was literally fly out of the seat of your pants. We were not uh, prepared for this kind of thing. But what happened was, during that devastation, almost everyone was put on an equal playing field. The hurricane didn't care if you were rich or if you were poor. It had no bias on who it destroyed. What I saw during that time, especially at the shelter, was when people choose to see each other as equals, things change. People who would normally never interact with each other were bringing meals to each other. They were opening their homes for showers. They were organizing donations. They were caring for each other's pets. And typically in these kinds of events, they say that the, the destruction or the, uh, the drive for survival will bring out the best in people. But I'm not entirely sure that that's true. I think that what happens in these types of situations is that it actually brings out our truest selves. Of the people who we can be when we peel away all of the masks and the facades. All of the identities that we wrap around ourselves. Now, unfortunately, that type of camaraderie faded as the days passed. But what it did was it showed me that the ability for us to 
move beyond judgments based solely on economic value is there. Only if we would trust ourselves to do it. We have to choose to do it. So going back to our story for today, how might that jailer's life have been less traumatic if his entire identity wasn't wrapped up in what the empire told him that he was worth? How would that slave girl have been valued if she wasn't only seen for the profit that she could bring to other people? And how might our lives be better too if our first assumption about anyone we meet is that they are a reflection of the image of God? Friends, that world is possible, but we have to lean into it. Especially and even when it causes trouble. Paul's journey here is a case study for what happens when we interrupt those types of systems. As another scholar puts it, reflecting on this, he says, it's almost as if the text is warning us today that if the church challenges unjust economic systems, it will be accused of political offenses. And isn't that the case? If we, bow, if we value people for their identity first as beloved children of God rather than their sole contributions to the economy, that changes the system. That moves us closer to the vision for the world that Jesus preached and that the early church tried to live out. So go out from here today and try it. See what it feels like to connect with people based on how Jesus views them. Not this world or this economy. It may just change us all for the better. Amen.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We will report, re respond to what we believe with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He is descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, what joys and concerns do we have this morning? Dave Wilson requests prayer for a positive outcome Tuesday after his replacement surgery. God, Pat, in your mercy, our prayer. Pat and Nino request prayers for their grandson, Benico, who is beginning his college experience at uh, Monmouth University on September the 2nd. God, in your mercy, our prayer. And Deborah Carries has requested prayers needed for her friend's daughter, Sheila. Her cancer has returned and it's on the bone. Her PET scan is Tuesday and we're praying for good news, not what we're afraid of. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What other joys and concerns do we have this morning? For our friend Roy Robson, who gave a presentation about Ukraine earlier on, whose cancer has returned. Say the last part again. His cancer has returned. Cancer has returned. Oh, God. Okay. God, in your mercy, prayer. our prayer. Prayers for the family of Dan Hamilton. He died on Friday. He, my husband, hired him and they were friends for over 40 years. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Was that, was that Lottie? Was that? Continue yeah, prayer for my daughter, Maria Crawford, who's at University of Penn. Thank you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah, I want us to pray for my uncle, Afonso Gay. He is a member of this church. He went to Liberia, uh, let's say four, five months now. He has been sick from cancer. Hmm. Thank you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want you to please help me to pray for Mr. Joe, Pastor Nasi's husband, to get better soon. Thank you. Absolutely. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
We also continue to pray for B and for Vlad and for Derexa and Anne and Pat and Jerry and Bob as well. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to pray for all the teachers that are going back to the classroom these next coming weeks. I pray that any of you that have interactions with teachers for your kids or in any ways for patients, uh, this is, we thought COVID was hard. I think we've hit a whole new wave of what hard and difficult is for this amazing profession that gets overlooked. And as you were saying, you know, respect of what people do. We need to hold up our teachers. Hopefully God watches over all of them as they are hit with something they have definitely not gotten in their education. Um, so I, I pray for all of you to have extreme patience with whatever comes your way and your kids. Uh, so hopefully we can have a good school year. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. Pray for our Sunday school that starts in two weeks. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. Friends, with all these things and more on our minds, let us go to God in prayer this morning. As part of the prayer, I will say, God of mercy, please respond again with hear our prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you call us to relinquish the cares and the concerns of our lives to you so that we might serve you in perfect freedom. Hear us as we bring before you these petitions of our hearts and our minds, of all those that we have named this morning. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the Universal Church. May our words and actions bring honor to your name, that they teach us true humility. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we pray for the needs of the world that may peace pervade in all places of conflict and violence. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer from sickness of mind or body or spirit, and for all those who give care for them, God of mercy, hear our prayers. For those who now worship in the presence of Christ, that those who will this day, God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you call us to follow you with faithfulness, even when it challenges our relationships and our values of our culture. Help us to release our fears, nurture us in your ways, and sustain us as we seek your peace. We ask all of this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There are various ways for people to give their offerings to the church. Um, for those on at home, they can either mail in, or you can make a contribution online. We also use tithely as a means for collecting uh, funds. Give now with generous hearts that all people may hear God's word and be helped by the work of this church. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, who brings joy out of sorrow, plenty out of want, and life out of death, we thank you for the treasures of the earth, your creation filled with your blessing, for it was in company with these earthly things that your Son came to dwell, showing us the enormity of your love. Because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we too are brought to new life, called to pray and work for the renewal of others. So take these offerings for the sake of the one without whom our poverty would be extreme. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the first and fourth verse of our final hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. to the world, have courage, hold on to what is good, render unto no one evil for evil, strengthen the weak, support the faint-hearted, honor all people. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love both today and forevermore. And let us all say together, Amen. Amen.